Hi, everybody. Welcome to the midterm review. I'm so sorry we had issues tonight with our um, Adobe Connect. I've never had such issues with it before. I'm going to investigate other avenues um, if that's going to start causing issues for me. But anyway, I am developing this midterm review YouTube video for you so that you can have a heads up on the material that you need to cover. And you know, I disclaim this every time I do a video that this is not all inclusive of the material that will be covered on the exam. Some of the material may be covered, some of it may not. When I do these lectures, I do them as a teaching experience so that you can utilize some of the experience that I've had and experienced in my career, so that you can utilize that in your career as well. So let's go ahead and get started with our video. Okay. Safe sleep. This is one of the first opportunities we have to teach parents about uh, their newborn, and that is how we can reduce the occurrence of sudden infant death syndrome in this population. Now, we've learned over the years that babies that sleep on their back have a lower incidence of sudden infant death. We've also learned that parents who smoke have an increased risk of having a child that suffers from sudden infant death syndrome. We also know that we don't want bumper pads or pillows in the crib. Use tight fitting sheets. Overheating is a big thing. As you can see, the infant in the picture has a bunting that she's wearing. Uh, that takes the place of a blanket. This baby does not need a blanket. They should be on a firm mattress on their back to sleep in a crib. No bed sharing, no toys in the crib. And uh, some of these policies have changed throughout the years. Uh, when I was a new nurse, we used to put babies on their tummies. And then several years following that, it was the back to sleep program that was initiated. And we, need to cha we needed to change all of our policies. Now, this isn't to say that it's important for babies to have tummy time. Babies do need tummy time to help reduce the misshaping of heads. And you can see many children today are or infants are wearing helmets to reshape their heads. And that's being because they haven't had adequate tummy time. Tummy time takes place when the baby is awake and when the mother is there giving its personal one-on-one -on -one attention throughout the duration of the time that baby's on tummy time. So it's important to teach those principles to the, your parents. All right, vitamin K. Uh, vitamin K is a very important vitamin because it is involved in the coagulation of blood. And vitamin K is synthesized in the intestine. Now, one of the things the intestines needs in order to synthesize this vitamin K is bacteria. And newborns don't have bacteria in their intestinal tract. They have meconium. And meconium is a sterile substance primarily composed of deciduous materials, that and skin cells that occur in the uh, amniotic sac during gestation. So they have a sterile intestinal tract. Now having a sterile intestinal tract and a, a vitamin K deficiency puts infants at an increased risk of bleeding. So we typically will inject vitamin K into the newborns when they are first born and then by the time the uh, babies start eating, now they have bacteria in their intestinal tract and they start to produce vitamin K on their own. Now, sometimes parents will refuse the prophylaxis of vitamin K and um, this is becoming more prevalent in society. In fact, as I was researching to develop this PowerPoint presentation, I was shocked to see that there were so many resources out there uh, telling parents not to allow vitamin K to be injected, that there's a black box warning on vitamin K. Well, of course there is. There's a black box warning on many things. It doesn't mean that it is something that shouldn't be used. So uh, you will come across parents in your practice that will refuse vitamin K, but it's our responsibility to educate patients uh, when I worked in the hospital as a nursing director in the OB department, if parents re 
requested that vitamin K not be administered, this now had to be elevated to the legal department, and the legal department had to, to create a form for the parents to sign um, to reduce any risk of legal liability if the infant indeed begin to bleed for some reason. So um, things to consider and ponder in your practice. Jaundice. Now there's two different types of jaundice. Jaundice is a yellowing that occurs in the skin of the baby. It's very common. There's physiologic jaundice, which is typically uh, occurs after 24 hours. You'll see that the bilirubin is greater than five milligrams per deciliter of blood. And all babies are detected for bilirubin level at 24 hours of birth using a little device that they place on their forehead. With physiologic jaundice, it typically occurs due to um, the babies getting rid of red blood cells. And when babies are in utero, they require a lot of red blood cells to survive. The average oxygen saturation for a baby in utero is about 30 to 35%. And the reason they can survive is because they have an enormous amount of red blood cells carrying oxygen. Now, once they're born, they don't need those red blood cells anymore, so their body tries to get rid of them all at once. And one of the byproducts of the degradation of all of these red blood cells is a substance called bilirubin. Bilirubin is synthesized through the liver and excreted through the bowel and urine. Well, newborns don't have a lot of bowel movements, and they don't urinate a whole lot because a breastfed mother's milk doesn't come in for three to five days. So they have the, an increased risk of developing this bilirubin. Bottle-fed babies are at a decreased risk because they're typically getting two to three ounces of formula every three to four hours. They're having more bowel movements. They're able to get rid of those of the excess bilirubin through their stool more rapidly than the breastfed mom. But eventually, it's not detectable. Now, some babies even with physiologic jaundice, have to go under the ultraviolet lights to have it absorbed through the skin, but most of the time, it's not. Pathologic jaundice appears within 24 hours, and the increased bilirubin is greater than 5 milligrams per deciliter of blood, but it increases at a rate of 0.2 deciliters per hour. Now, this can become dangerous because if the bilirubin increases to a level of over 21, it can cause a condition called kernicterus, and kernicterus causes brain damage. Now, this is not such an issue in this country today because we are monitoring bilirubin levels, and uh, women who have RH negative blood, which was a big factor for kernicterus back in the days, utilize Rogam uh, during their pregnancy. They get uh, uh, generally a Rogam uh, shot at 28 weeks. It's a, a booster because they should get one after each pregnancy and then at 28 weeks, as a, uh, they get a half dose at 28 weeks. But sometimes it can occur. I had a patient once that um, had a, a baby that was uh, high drops, RH sensitized because she had had a voluntary interruption of pregnancy, was RH negative and did not receive Rogam after the procedure. So now this pregnancy was RH sensitized. So this baby was at a great risk of developing kernicterus after the delivery. So we had to watch very closely to ensure that this didn't occur. Okay, reflexes. When babies are born, they have a whole bunch of reflexes. And we need to uh, know what the reflexes are so that we can tell our parents what to expect. And also, we need to know when they disappear so that the parents won't think something has dreadfully happened because the grasp reflex is no longer in effect after six months of age. So um, we need to know the, the, the basic ones, uh, moral grasp, rooting, those are the most common ones that you're going to see. Placing, sometimes it's called stepping, uh, but those are the ones you want to keep in mind. Whoops. Body mass index is um, something we need to know as practitioners, not only in the pediatric population, 
but in the adult population as well. And we need to know the parameters of uh, not only what normal weight is, but what a normal BMI is and how do we classify underweight, healthy, overweight, and obese. So a healthy weight I know is a BMI of under 25 and overweight is a BMI of over 25. Obesity is classified as a BMI of greater than 40. Well child visits are very important aspects of health care in children. The first two years are really the most important because those two years uh, we see the patients much more frequently. Typically, providers want to see the baby a few days after they go home from the hospital and then perhaps at two weeks and then at a month. Every provider has a different uh, routine that they follow. Uh, some uh, every week, uh, then every month and every two months. And what they're doing during those visits is evaluating the growth and development of the child to ensure that they're on task and not perhaps going into that failure to thrive category where they're in the 10th percentile of weight and growth. Uh, doing physical examinations to see if there's any uh, abnormal conditions associated with the stage of development. Uh, anticipatory guidance is a big thing. What is that? That is us talking to the parents and having a conversation with them of what they should expect to occur from now until the next time they come to the provider's office. So that then when we see them, we can ask, are they saying two words? Are they looking at you in the eye? Are they smiling? Are they uh, rolling from front to back? Whatever they should be doing during that developmental stage, we as a provider want to, want to catch it right away. And we need to ex explain this to parents so they know what to look for. So I can say to the parents, when you come back for your next visit, um, Tommy should be saying two to three words. He should be taking two, two to three steps, uh, walking with hands or whatever he should be doing at that developmental stage. And then when the parent comes back and you want to build a routine so you know that you're always going to tell the parents these three things to look at. So, okay, this is an eight month checkup. So the eight, at the eight month checkup, I'm going to ask this, this, this. And then when they come in for the eight month checkup, then you can say, is Tommy doing this, this, this? So you want to build a routine. Not only is it good for your practice, but it's good for your liability risk. If you always document the same thing and always follow the same pattern of practice, lawyers love that. So if any of your cases were to go to litigation, you can. it wouldn't be a question. So if you say, well, they're saying that you missed this developmental delay, you can say that's not possible because at the eighth month visit, I always ask the parents if the child is doing this, this, this. So it's just a good practice to get into. Immunizations. The child typically receives their first immunization, which is a hepatitis B vaccine while they're still in the hospital. And then they'll get the second one when they're one month of age. Uh, immunizations are an important part of preventative health care and as providers we need to educate parents of the importance of vaccinations. And as parents we want what's best for our children and uh, as I state throughout this lecture the internet is a wonderful web however it can also uh, be treacherous as there's so much misinformation on the internet and we who are knowledgeable know how to decipher the difference between good information and bad information, the layman parent may not. So uh, our, the practice that I work for actually has a policy in place that if you do not immunize, immunize your children, they are not allowed to be seen in our practice. So you'll get your children immunized. If not, you're going to have to find care outside of the um, organization that I'm employed with. Now, infant exams, uh, we know, and many of you know from your assessment course, you build a method of examination. For me, I've got my method. I always do 
the ears, not, oh, I follow a pattern. So my pattern is to look in the ears, eyes, nose, throat. Then I listen to the heart and lungs last. That's just the way I do things. It's the pattern I developed over the 10 years of working as a nurse practitioner. Other people may do it differently. But where children are concerned, you're not going to follow that same pattern because you want to do whatever is, is the most invasive. You want to do that last because children are often not the most cooperative patients. Now, in the setting that I work at, we see patients that are 12 months and above. At 12 months and above, they connect going to see the provider with a shot. So I often get kids that are just terrified to come into the office. They might cry from the minute they enter until the time they go. Very hard to do an examination on these kids. If uh, things I do to try to ease the, the visit, I, with these little ones, I'll go out into the, I, I take off my lab coat, I take off my stethoscope, I go out and start the visit in the waiting room just by interacting with the child and the parent. And then when they come in, I have toys to distract them. Um, I examine on the parent's lap because they feel much more comfortable there. Um, if the parent is sitting in a chair, they don't always have to get on the exam table, but if parent's sitting in a chair, I can do it that way too. Um, I leave the diaper on most of the time. I do look at the genitalia, but I'll pull it away uh, instead of pulling it off. I talk softly and start with the heart and lungs first and then go to the ears and throat last. Now, if the babies come in and they're sleeping, yay, I'm going to do the heart and lungs. Get that out of the way right away because then when I do the ears and the throat, I'm going to wake them up and disrupt them. So you do need to make some modifications with an infant exam. Now, development is important. We need to have a good grasp on development uh, so that we can guide the parents in the anticipatory guidance uh, teaching. So we need to have a good understanding of what they should be doing at six months and 12 months. And I like this um, slide because it gives you a good thumbnail sketch of some of the things to consider in development. And this is something that you need to focus on, not only for the examination, but when you take your certification exam, it, it carries this heavily um, of the development. All right, hemoglobin. So we check children's hemoglobin levels at different times most children get it checked at age two and then before school uh, and these are the parameters so you should know the parameters of uh, children uh, their ages for teens children and children young children and what their parameters should be what the threshold is lead now let's look and see now cdc is the centers for disease control and prevention AAP is the American uh, Association of Pediatrics, and they are like the gold standard of pediatric teaching. So they typically will do screening on children um, at age two and then at preschool or kindergarten. Now, where I live, I live near the city of Chicago. I practice near the city of Chicago. And they do mandatory lead screening on kids more frequently who live in the Chicago area because there's such a high probability of the paint in the old apartment building being lead based. So they do it more frequently. And checking this is critical because elevated lead levels in children can cause a lot of learning issues. So lead screening is what needs to be done. Autism. And I think that we hear a lot about autism today, not only with the association with vaccines, which is completely false, but I think it's being recognized more often. I think that's one of the reasons that it has uh, made more prevalence in um, journals today. And, and that's a good thing uh, that we're catching it sooner. 
in that anticipatory guidance, some of the things that you're going to be teaching your parent, your parents is the warning signs of autism. And you know, that big one is not looking the parents in the eye, uh, not being able to get their attention, not smiling, all of those typical behavior things that you'd see in little kids. Uh, and it, this can occur in a child that was um, developing normally, and then all of a sudden they develop these new behaviors. The um, MCHAT is a screening tool that you can use to identify autism risk. And if they score a level on this risk assessment, then you would send them off for further evaluation. I think you'll find if you plan on specializing in pediatrics or having a high population of pediatrics in your practice, there are an enormous amount of screening tools that you can utilize. One of the wonderful things that our pediatric practice has is sheets that they have the parents fill out when they come in that actually answers those anticipatory guidance questions that we would ask them. And it also tells them what to expect, what they should be looking for from now until the next visit. So these are all learning tools and there are so many of them available out there. So definitely uh, when you have an opportunity to go and examine, look for those uh, wonderful screening tools that are out there. I don't know why I'm touching that. Vaccinations. Now, adolescent vaccinations, you're going to see, and this is something the provider needs to follow up on periodically because these do change. Uh, a few years ago, uh, they changed the meningococcal. It was only uh, optional. And then it became mandatory for seniors. And now they've changed it to the first dose at 11 to 12 and the second dose 16 to 18. The HPV is not a mandatory uh, immunization. However, it's recommended. If HPV is administered by age nine, they only need two doses. If it's administered after age 11, they need a series of three. Now, this is not a mandatory immunization. Tdap, uh, they need one dose between 11 and 12 years of age, and they should get a dose every 10 years. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, in the area that I live, there was a resurgence of whooping cough, so they made it mandatory that all students entering their senior year of high school had to get a Tdap, and that was to cover whooping cough. And then influenza is optional. So, But the meningococcal and the Tdap, you will not be allowed in school if you don't have that. Now, this slide speaks to intussusception, and the reason that I have uh, put this on here is actually associated with immunizations, because if children go through their series, they typically get an immunization for the rotavirus between three and four months of age. Now, if they don't get that immunization, and it's now nine months, and you're thinking that you have to do the makeup immunizations, they can't get the rotavirus because if they get the rotavirus immunization after nine months of age, it increases their risk of developing intussusception, which is actually a telescoping of the bowel. And this is really a very uh, emergent situation. Uh, it causes extreme pain and uh, is considered an emergency. Pityriasis rosea is a rash that occurs not just in the child, in the pediatric population, it occurs in adults as well. Uh, Pityriasis rosea is a virus and it is self-limiting, no treatment is necessary. You'll see that the rash develops, uh, the, the, the first sign of the rash is the development of a herald patch. And a herald patch is a lesion that is about two to three times larger than the other uh, patches that will develop or plaques that will develop on the body. And it usually uh, is first seen two to three weeks prior to the development of the other um, plaques that occur. Uh, it's intensively itchy. Uh, so you wanna avoid being overheated or hot, no hot showers. In extreme cases, they'll utilize UV light to help reduce the side effects and symptoms. But most often it's self-limiting. There isn't really anything that you can do to make it go away. And Pitago is uh, a, a 
infectious process that occurs and you can see around the nose and mouth it's characterized primarily by golden crusts that develop and it's wet and um, you see this very often in the toddler and early childhood um, patient because little kids like nothing better than to be picking stuff up they shouldn't be and putting it in their mouth and nose and developing these bacterial infections. Now there are two ways to treat this bacterial infection. You can try utilizing Bactroban. Uh, it's an ointment that you can use, but in a case like this, you would need to use a, a broad spectrum antibiotic like amoxiclav, Keflex, or Omnicef. I personally use Omnicef because of the reduced uh, GI side effects that occur with it, and it also actually covers three separate types of bacteria that the other two don't. And the dose for Ceftonir would be 14 milligrams per kilogram per day. All right, acute atopic dermatitis. This used to be called eczema, but uh, this is typically an intense itchy red papule associated with excoriations. It'll have a serous exudate and you'll see it occur in the creases of the arms and behind the legs. It is an immunologic issue. Uh, these kids typically are allergic to lots of stuff. It can be pollens, foods, uh, and that can trigger one of these reactions. There are many different treatments out today, but with these particular types of patients, you wanna keep it, um, you wanna, if it's acute like this, uh, you can use a moist wrap on it. You can use uh, low, ster low dose steroid creams. And there's a new product out called Eucrisa that works really well on this. But you always want to try um, the least invasive uh, product first before you would move up to something more uh, invasive or stronger. Now, as a healthcare provider, one of our responsibilities is to always be on the lookout for physical warnings of sexual abuse and child abuse and neglect in children. We actually have a legal obligation to report any incident that we think may be related to a child abuse. Now in the hospital, we would call social service, social service would call DCFS, and that's how the process would get going. Now in a private office setting, we would call DCFS ourselves because we have to report it. In severe cases, we may have to call the police because we cannot release the child to the parent if we suspect abuse is taking place and not having done anything about it. Shaken baby syndrome, it occurs from, it's a whiplash that occurs from the, the rapid uh, forward and backward movement of the baby. You know, you have to consider the baby's head is a third of its total body weight. It's really heavy and the neck muscles are very immature. So we have to teach parents to always support the head. And also we need to explain to parents that there are going to be times throughout this baby's life where it's going to be crying to the point where it's inconsolable. And you're going to be sleep deprived. You may be working also and trying to manage the house. So you may have other children and you may be to the point where you want to pull your hair out. It's okay to have mom come over and take care of the baby for a while or to put the baby in the crib and close the door, um, but it's never okay to shake a baby, whether out of anger or if you think that you're playing with the baby. It's never, never okay to shake a baby. Vernix. This is when we started having issues. But Vernix is that thick, cheesy-like substance that is on the outside of babies when they're born. The earlier in gestation that they're born, the more of it they will have. Now, back in the days when I worked as a labor and delivery nurse in the early 80s, they wanted a, the parents couldn't get us to wipe that vernix off soon enough. They didn't like it. It was yucky. Well, now we find that vernix actually has some very important properties, and now we are not making an effort to remove it. 
we are actually massaging it in the skin. And we found, you know what? It's okay. Babies don't need to get a bath right after they're born. Let's mas massage this Vernix in. Let's give them a bath tomorrow, an hour or two hours tomorrow, or just not do it at all for the first day. So um, this is a, a change in practice, which you're going to see. My 30 years of nursing, I have seen so many practices disappear and then come back and then disappear and then come back. And you'll see this in your career as well. Now, what you're seeing on this slide is a normal newborn growth chart. And on the chart, you'll see that there are lines. Now, if you, when a baby comes in, one of the first things you're going to do is do the height and weight. Every time the baby comes in, you're going to do a height and weight. And you're going to put that height and weight on this chart. You'll draw, draw a little dot where their weight is and you'll draw a little dot where their height is. Now my electronic medical record does it for me so I don't have to do it on a paper chart, but it's good for you to see it so you can see the experience of it. Now ideally we like babies or we like children to be in the 50th percentile because that means that 50% of the population is bigger than you and 50% of the population is smaller than you. What does that say? You're right in the middle. That's great. What a good, good place to be right in the middle. Now for height, being in the 90th percentile is not necessarily a terrible thing, but it is something to keep an eye on. If you have someone who is going over the 100th percentile, we need to consider, is there a uh, developmental issue here where they are growing at an abnormal rate? Uh, also with weight, we need to be conscious. Oh, this is in the 90th percentile with children. We would never put a child on a diet, but we are going to go over what the parent is feeding the child uh, to see why they are, are in such a high uh, grouping. Now, on the other end of that, we're going to look to see if they aren't growing enough to look for developmental delays in growth and weight. In the 10th percentile, we want to rule out that there isn't any failure to thrive. Now, Initially, when babies are first born by day three or four, they lose a little bit of weight. They lose about 10% of their weight, but they gain that back right away. By uh, four to seven months, they actually should double their birth weight. So those are all things you need to keep in consideration in your pediatric population. The introduction of foods. Now, parents are going to come in, especially new parents with no um, experience with children are going to have a zillion questions. They're going to want to know when they can begin to introduce foods. Now, by the time a uh, child is three years of age, they should be eating whatever you're eating at the table. You know, you may be conscious to make sure you're not giving them foods they can choke on, but they should be eating everything you're eating at the table. <laughs> Other considerations is choking and you want to make sure they're eating high quality food that's good for them, not the junk food. All right, caput versus cephalohematoma. Caput is a swelling that occurs on the baby's head. It's typically due to molding or the way the baby has been in the birth canal. Um, it's self-limiting, no pathologic significance, reabsorbs, goes away on its own. <coughs> Excuse me. A cephalohematoma is actually a collection of blood uh, between the skull and the periosteum. This is, uh, it, it may be of no significance, but you can see this an increase in uh, providers that have used a vacuum to uh, aid in the extraction of the infant through the birth canal. Uh, in these babies, we need to be on the lookout for uh, bilirubin because their level of bilirubin may be elevated because now they have more red blood cells that are outside the circulation that can cause uh, an increase in bilirubin. And uh, in some cases, they may actually want to explore to ensure that there is not a uh, fracture, a cranial fracture. Cleft lip and cleft palate. Now these babies sometimes can be born with just a cleft palate. Sometimes they're born with a cleft lip and a cleft palate. 
Now, these things typically, they, the surgical repair they're doing for cleft palate today is amazing. You can barely tell that there was any occurrence at all. But they typically wait a little while before they do the surgical repair. So there are all different types of devices you can use to help with feeding. Feeding can be a little challenging with these babies because they can't get a good suction device. Now, there, uh, there are ways that professionals can teach these babies moms and babies how to breastfeed or if you're bottle feeding they have special nipples that you can use that will help that suck um, but most of the time um, they, they may have a little issue with the, the feeding but it, they can um, be taught how to to get it we could be taught how to get around that mongolian spots are a dark darkening pigment of the skin typically around uh, bony prominences and you'll see this in um, those who have a darker skin tone um, it's more prevalent there isn't anything wrong they can be mistaken for bruises um, but they aren't it's just a discoloration of the skin uh, and as i said the darker the skin tone the more likely they are to have this difficulty with breastfeeding so when you're doing the examination of your baby, you're looking at the lingual frenulum, and that is the little piece of skin that attaches the tongue to the lower palate. And some babies, it extends to the tip of the tongue, and if that's the case, these babies may have difficulty with breastfeeding. They used to call this tongue-tied, and uh, <clears throat> sometimes they will uh, cut that to release the frenulum. Um, I've seen some cases where it hasn't been cut either. They've just learned how to, to suck with it. So um, I guess if it's not severe, they just leave it alone. Um, but that's uh, something we look for in the examination of our babies. The physical examination in the pediatric population always begins with observation. Uh, the order of the exam fits the child in the circumstances, and we spoke to this earlier. We want to hold off and do those disruptive procedures at the end, uh, unless the baby's screaming and crying, then it doesn't really matter so much, but we would like to try and uh, hold those things off to the end. Cardiac def defects, uh, just some tips. Um, these are, are def typically identified at birth or right after birth. They are PDA and VSD and an ASD. And that's uh, patent ductus arteriosus and the ventral septal defect and an atrial septal defect. These are left to right shunts and some general points that you wanna consider. But these are typically, uh, sometimes they need to be surgically repaired uh, and sometimes not. The PDA is, is very important to be open during uh, when the baby is a fetus, but when it's born, it should close within 24 to 48 hours. VSD and ASD are, are, are um, little holes between those, the ventricles and the atrium. And um, if you detect that, it needs they need to have an echo done and um, follow up with cardiology. Cytomegalovirus is a virus that preg pregnant women um, should try to avoid uh, with uh, when, during pregnancy. And they may have been exposed to it already, but you certainly don't want to have uh, it when you're pregnant. It can cause uh, developmental and uh, mental delays. And uh, healthcare workers are at a, an increased risk there isn't any vaccination right now, uh, but this is something that uh, we need to be cognizant of and be careful with hand washing. So this is uh, what we're going to teach our uh, parents to be. Uh, molluscum, <clears throat> I see this a lot in practice. It's a virus and this picture looks exactly like what it looks like. It's self-limiting. There isn't any treatment for it and it can take a long, long time to go away. Um, I have a dermatologist friend who uh, I was discussing this with since I see this so often. And he said, if it's really disturbing to the parents, they can come in and they will get rid of them. 
uh, they will remove them, but in all likelihood, they'll come back. So just leave them alone. It's in, it is contagious, though. So <clears throat> we have to be very cautious. Candida albicans uh, rash. This is a, a, a bad diaper rash. How do you know the difference between uh, uh, candida diaper rash and a regular diaper rash? This doesn't go away. You can buy every diaper cream out on the market, and it isn't going to work. So you can see on the right hand of the slide the different characteristics of a dermatitis, a fungal, and bacteria. It's good to know those things when you're, when you're dealing with the pediatric population because you're going to see a lot of skin stuff. The uncover cover test of the eye. Uh, this is something that you're going to do on a, uh, an annual physical, and you're doing this to check for muscle strength. The corneal light reflex, you look at where the light is reflected in each eye. With the eye examination, this chart is what we use for the non-readers, the little kids. And uh, when you're looking, when you're doing an ocular exam, the things you're going to look for in the, in the eye when you're looking through the ophthalmoscope, um, what I am looking for is to make sure that that optic cup is nice and round and that the, um, or the, the disc is nice and round, uh, that the vessels and veins are not nicked or swollen because that's an indication of increased intracranial pressure. All right, uh, dacrocystitis and dacroadenitis. This is a clogged tear duct, and they typically go away on their own using hot packs. Sometimes you have to use an antibiotic, uh, and in that case, you would use a broad spectrum. You can see here we've got Augmentin that they're using. Now this one is a big one. A white glow in a child's eye could be a sign of eye cancer. So if you don't see red, see an eye doctor. Now one of the first things that I do on kids when they're on babies, when I used to see babies in the hospital, was to check for the red reflex. Dark, dark in the room, get my light, look in the eye. You should see red in both eyes. If not, you need to um, send them out for a uh, consult. And um, I actually read a case last year of a retinoblastoma, which is what that is, that was misdiagnosed. And these things are almost always curable. They remove the eye. There's no issue. This one was not followed up with so long in advance that it ended up metastasizing. And it was a, a huge settlement. And the, 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 hor the horrible thing about the case was one of the issues was that the parent was not compliant. The parent did not bring the baby in for regular examinations, would typically only bring the baby in sporadically, and it had, it got missed. So this is something that you definitely need to um, check on your newborns when they come in. Congenital cataract. I mean, this is this will hit you in the in the head when you see it because it's so prominent, uh, that white in the center of the eye. The six cardinal fields of gaze, and we're doing this to check the muscle movements of the eye. Also, I do this on my all my sports physical kids because I'm looking for nystagmus. Stag, nystagmus can be present in a brain lesion, but um, this is something you should do on your patients for with their annual physicals or in their sports physicals. Preauricular sinus. See that little dot right there? That is actually a sinus that didn't develop in the embryologic phase and there typically isn't anything to do with it just leave it alone it'll close on its own or it just kind of becomes an empty little hole there um, but you want to keep it clean because I've seen cases of that that have abscessed uh, due to poor hygiene practices and that was really yucky lymph nodes uh, part of a physical is to check the lymph nodes. Uh, when my kids come in when they're sick, I always check the
the upper lymph nodes. If they come in for their sports physical or for an annual physical, I check their superficial or surface lymphatics. Those are always easily felt, and I check to see that they aren't enlarged, that they don't have any fixed nodules there. Shoddy nodes. Now, what is a shoddy node? If children have had a bad infection where their lymph nodes have swollen, those lymph nodes, once the infection resolves, will always stay a little bit bigger. And those are now called shoddy nodes. Um, they're typically about less than a centimeter in size. They're mobile, they're not tender, there's no redness, there's no heat. They are firm, So, uh, but they're not tumor. Uh, they have a history of a past infection where that node has been swollen. Causes of wheezes and ronchi in kids. Uh, unilateral might be pneumonia. Foreign body aspiration is a big one too. Um, medial stinal mass, tuberculosis, bronchial, uh, bronchiectasis, vascular ring. Uh, bilateral asthma, bronchiolitis, mycoplasma, cystic fibrosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, severe pneumonia. Those are both sides. Croup in children. And I, I used to hate it when my kids would get croup, and I get lots of kids who come in with croup. Uh, you can see what croup is. This is a narrowing of the airway, um, this swollen tissue causes a restriction of the vocal cords. So when they cough, it gives it has that characteristic barky sound. Uh, we treat this typically with humidified air, um, sometimes steroids, although that is controversial right now. Uh, so uh, you need to ensure that the airway is not compromised and that they are able to breathe this can be caused by a virus also. Croup is typically viral in nature. Otitis externa. And I really like this slide too because you can, you can see this is a swimmer's ear. And how do kids develop swimmer's ear? Typically, I mean, we have bacteria all over our body and all, on the inside of our body too. It's the proliferation of bacteria that we already have on us that makes us sick. So we have bacteria in our ear, we go swimming, water gets in our ear. Bacteria loves nothing more than a dark, moist, warm spot. Okay, now it's got a dark, warm, moist spot. It's gonna proliferate and grow and grow and grow and it's going to end up causing an infection in the outer ear canal. Now with an outer ear canal, the treatment is eardrops. An oral antibiotic does not build to the level of concentration sufficient to kill the bacteria in an otitis externa. So eardrops is always going to be the uh, treatment for an otitis externa. And here are some other pictures that show an otitis externa. An otitis media. Now an otitis media is an infection in the inner ear. So it's an infection that goes past the eardrum. So what we're looking at right now is the eardrum. The eardrum is translucent and I can see the bony prominences behind it. The cone of light, the, malia, uh, the malleus, the pars tensa, and you see the location where everything is. This is what an ear is supposed to look like when you put that otoscope in. Now remember, with little kids, you're going to pull that pinna up and out to get a better visualization. Now let's look over here. You can see the ear A, there's some serous fluid accumulating from 1 to 7 o'clock. That's serous fluid. That doesn't necessarily mean this ear is infected. This means this kid's got a bad cold. This one in B is a bulging otitis externa. This is an ear that could rupture if you don't treat. In C, C is a questionable ear. Now we're trying not to treat otitis externa as aggressively as we used to because of the resistance of antibiotics. I have to honestly tell you, if I saw this ear in practice, I would treat it. And then D is a tympanic, uh, um, a PE tube that's in. So this little kid has an ear tube in place. 
And it's always surprising when you do an ear exam and you see one in there when the parents didn't tell you that they had ear surgery. And here's an example of how to do an ear exam on a little one. What a cooperative baby. Allergic appearance. Okay. These are kids that come in. I know they've got allergies. You can see this little one at the bottom here. He has atopic dermatitis on the cheeks. Look at behind the knees. That's atopic dermatitis. Look at that. Now, these kids with allergies, the way he's snuffing his nose with his hand, they can actually build a, um, a crease, a permanent crease in their, no in their nose. And that's a sign of allergies. The red itchy eyes. These are allergic shiners up here on the upper left-hand side. And if I were to look up this person's nose, those turbinates that are up there would be swollen, but they would be a pale color, not bright, angry red like a virus. And this is how you look up the nose. When you look up the nose, you see that these appendages here are called turbinates. And when you get sick, or if you have an allergy attack, these turbinates swell and it can impede the breathing. That's why you get, you can't, you get stuffy. You can't get a good sniff in there. If a patient has total obstruction, that can be cumbersome. You're gonna have, uh, you might end up with chronic uh, swollen turbinates and they actually sometimes will do surgery to reduce the size of those. But I love using a steroid nasal spray on my patients with swollen turbinates. It really, really helps to reduce the inflammation, not only in allergies, but in people who have viruses too. All right, acute epiglitis. Now this is something that we really shouldn't see anymore because the HIB immunization that children get in infancy is protection against the, H the Hib, uh, against uh, epiglottitis. But if you were to see it, this is a medical emergency. And this is the case where you want to take a look. If you see, oh my gosh, that throat looks closed, they go to the emergency room because to aggressively look in the back of the throat makes it worse. And these children often need to be intubated. That's how severe the, the closure gets. Different types of coughs. Kids get these coughs and they last forever. Uh, it's it and parents get I, I get parents all the time they bring their kids in he's been coughing for a week and I explain to the parents you know I, his lungs are beautifully clear this cough might last a month so let's see what we can do to minimize the uh, effects in his life because of this cough maybe they're wheezing they might need some steroids they might need an inhaler they might need a nebulizer treatment but if they've got that yucky post nasal drippy cough there's not a whole lot we can do for it. Humidified air, hot steamy showers, lots and lots of fluids, using saline up the nose. Right now, the American Association of Pediatrics, oh sorry, the American Academy of Pediatrics is discouraging the use of any um, medication intervention in children under the age of five for these things, unless they need a steroid or an inhaler. So no decongestants, no cough suppressants. Saline up the nose will work because most of the time these coughs are caused by post-nasal drip and it helps to thin those secretions. Croup in kids, oh, I've added that slide twice. Preemie lungs, so <clears throat> when babies are born uh, premature, they're at an increased risk of a virus called RSV. RSV is more prevalent in the fall, and there is an immunization for RSV. It's called Synergis. It's incredibly expensive, and the, the problem with Synergis is that the immunization only lasts the one month, so they have to get this immunization every month through the peak months of RSV season. So they pretty much limit the use of Synergis to those who are uh, extreme preemies, Uh, bronchiolitis, this is what a bronchiolitis looks like in a little kid, and essentially what it is is an inflammation of the bronchus uh, with mucus buildup. These kids might need steroids, um, humidified air, but these things that we're describing, they are all viral in nature. An antibiotic isn't going to fix it. All right, Laryng laryngeal malacia. That's a big word. 
Um, but what it means is a floppy voice box. And sometimes kids are born and you'll detect that every once in a while, it sounds like they have Strider. It's really weird. I had a friend who's, whose son had it. And they can be just fine, but then all of a sudden, they act like they have Strider. It's like, holy moly, what's going on here? It's caused by a floppy voice box. A very small percentage of people develop respiratory problems which require medical or surgical interventions, but most of the time, this improves by itself by the time the child is 18 months of age. Typically, no complications, and it, it resolves itself. They grow out of it. All right, this is uh, pectus excavatum, and you'll see this, and it's where the um, normal chest, the top slide shows, or the top picture shows a normal chest. The bottom one so shows this depression of the breastbone. Uh, this may be concerning because this is a sign of um, Marfan syndrome, which is a uh, genetic disorder um, that can cause an elasticity of the art arteries. However, sometimes it can just be benign. Um, I have had two patients in particular who had extreme cases of this and that had them surgically corrected. Now, this surgery is awful. Um, this is what the patients told me, that it was absolutely horrible, horrendous, and painful. And one of the poor young men, it went back. It didn't stick. It, it ended up going back in on itself. And when I said, would you do it over again? He said, absolutely not. I'll learn to live with it. So that's how painful it was. Von Wildebrand disease, it's the most common inherited bleeding disorder. And um, just know a little bit about this. Don't study in depth, but just know that it, the, the, the primary characteristics of Von Wildebrand disease. Pinnex schlappen purpura, uh, that this is typically seen as raised reddish purple spots or bruised areas on the buttocks, legs, and feet. Uh, these kids can have abdominal pain, joint inflammation and pain, uh, foot and ankle swelling. Those are the primary characteristics of this particular disorder. I've never seen a case of it in practice. The cardiac exam. Anytime we're listening to anybody's heart, whether it's a pediatric patient or an adult patient, we should be listening to the five areas of the heart, aortic, pulmonic, herbs point, tricuspid, and mitral. And I make that part of my practice. I do this on every patient, whether they're in for a sick visit or a physical, I always listen to the five areas of the heart. Benign murmur. Uh, just know that stills murmur is one of those benign murmurs. It can occur at any time. Um, with this particular murmur, you want to listen to the patient supine and standing. So that's why when I do physicals on children, I always listen to their heart. I usually, I actually do it in three different positions. I do it sitting, standing, and laying down um, because I'm listening for different murmurs. Murmur grades. So you want to know the murmurs that... Um, a grades, you want to know which ones are associated with a thrill. Um, I know it's a lot to memorize on these pieces, but anytime there's a thrill present, that's concerning and you need to send them out for cardiology consult right away. Innocent murmurs are functional, also called functional or benign murmurs. They typically are not symptomatic at all. Um, they're x-ray is normal, their ECG is normal, they may have a continuous, um, it usually is systolic and less than a grade 3, 6 with no radi uh, radiation or transmission, no cyanosis, and this is usually present in children. Another innocent murmur is a venous hum very common between the ages of 2 to 5 and you're going to hear it best in the right upper sternal border um, the murmur is going to disappear in supine position, so that's why we're always listening uh, to um, in different areas. Kawasaki's disease, uh, red swollen hands and feet, 
big characteristics of Kawasaki's disease, strawberry tongue, uh, cardiac involvement, very prevalent, peeling of the hands. This is something that needs to be taken care of urgently because it can cause um, detrimental cardiac issues. Streptococcal. And see that throat over there on the left-hand side? That is what a strep throat looks like. Uh, you look at a lot of pictures and you see these big pussy white patches. I'd have to say eight out of ten times the throat looks like that one. Rheumatic fever is a complication that can occur due to untreated strep throat. Most often in children, it can cause uh, painful joints, a heart murmur, can cause kidney issues. Uh, complications are valve stenosis, valve regurgitation, and damage to the heart muscle, but it can also cause damage to the kidneys. Idiopathic thrombo uh, thrombocytic purpura uh, is essentially low platelet count, and we don't know why. Uh, it, it typically occurs often uh, after a viral infection in children <coughs> between the ages of two to five. The support, uh, the management is supportive corticosteroids, some in rare cases a splenectomy, but these things will often resolve on their own. Acne is a, a common complaint in the adolescent age. Know the different stages. You always want to start treatment with using a product that has uh, benzoyl peroxide. That's always the first line of treatment in stage one, benzoyl peroxide. When that doesn't work, I'm going to go to salicylic acid if that doesn't work, then we're going to consider some prescriptive measures. Hand, foot, and mouth disease, also called Coxsackie virus. You see this so much in the pediatric population. These kids typically present with a super high fever uh, and sores in, in their mouth. They may have a rash on the palms of their hand, the sole of their feet. They can also get rash all over the rest of their body. Um, this rash typically pops out after the, the fever is gone. It's a virus, there's no treatment for it. It's super contagious. ADHD, it seems like so many children are being treated with for ADHD nowadays. Um, but if the parents are concerned about the attention span or the inability of the child to concentrate, then they need to um, be screened for ADHD. There are uh, screening tools that you will have access to, to uh, determine whether or not uh, there is a risk of ADHD. ADHD is treated typically with a stimulants, which is surprising because if you think the child is hyperactive, stimulants actually have the reverse effect on kids with ADHD and helps them to focus and concentrate. Adolescent depression, depression uh, it's really more common than you think it is, especially today. Uh, children are at an increased risk of depression due to the iso social iso isolation that occurs today with the use of social media and um, the inability to interact with others. Uh, so uh, this is something that needs to be screened. In fact, on my adolescents, when they come in for annual physicals, I do a very thorough uh, screening. I have a tool in my EMR that I use uh, to screen all adolescents for depression risk. And that concludes our presentation for today. Um, so I certainly hope that this was of benefit to you, and I apologize again for the issues we had with Adobe Connect. Uh, I am going to contact um, my service provider tomorrow and find out what was going on. Um, I've had issues in the past, but never anything of this nature. So I certainly hope that you find this helpful and good luck on your exam.